Uh, I also want to thank uh, Bert and Ricardo for putting together this uh, great interdisciplinary workshop. I'm enjoying the discussions and the talks very much so far. Now in my talk, uh, I will be talking about how to use uh, physical devices uh, for machine learning. And in contrast to what we heard uh, earlier, this will be purely classical, so classical physics. But before I really uh, start, I want to I'll tell you a little bit about uh, where my group is involved in uh, machine learning. Uh, usually we are applying uh, neural networks to various uh, tasks that come up in physics. For example, uh, using reinforcement learning for quantum devices or using deep learning for mapping and geometries to topological dense structures. Or more recently, we've also uh, um, gotten very interested into artificial scientific discovery. And uh, one of the questions to ask there is uh, how to extract the most meaningful features from uh, the microscopic description of a physical model. So if you're interested, you can uh, look at these things uh, on our website. But what I will be talking about today uh, concerns this general scheme where you have some kind of physical device that uh, has some nonlinear dynamics. And so uh, if you can feed in some input in the form of say a wave and get some output, then you can view it as an information processing device. And if you also have some tunable parameters, uh, then there is a chance that you can train this device and make it uh, perform the input to output mapping that you wanted to have. And one of the simplest and most general ways to go about this, if you have some physical hardware that does this in principle, uh, how, how to go about training these parameters is of course just to look at the output and um, decide whether it deviates uh, from the desired output and then for example, use some electronic computer to figure out how to tune up the parameters. But this uh, raises the question, can we actually construct a self-learning machine? So what I mean by that is that the learning would be based purely on physical dynamics. So it would be purely autonomous. We have no feedback. You might still supply some energy. Maybe you come in with some uh, fields to generate some pulse dynamics, but none of this would depend on the current state of the machine. So it's really without any feedback. And if I want to represent this graphically, you would say that all the dynamics that we need for the training and for the learning, not only for the evaluation, but also for the training is going on internally inside the machine. So to provide some context, I want to talk a little bit about optical neural networks because obviously um, optical signal processing is very promising because you can process in parallel large amounts of data and so it's no wonder that uh, even back as early as the 80s, people have looked into the question, can we actually implement neural network like processing uh, using optics? And of course, one important ingredient you need is some nonlinearity. So you would use nonlinear optical effects of which there are many different varieties. And then you would have a device uh, such as the one shown here where you have some input wave, then you have a couple of nonlinear media and maybe some linear propagation in between, and then you get some output. And then the question is still, how do you uh, change the parameters of your device? And again, there are various uh, versions of doing this, but for example, you exploiting the nonlinearity, you could come in with some extra illumination from the side, which is patterned and can be structured. And depending on the structure of this extra illumination, you will, um, distort the wave front of the forward propagating wave in one or the other manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, then again, uh, the simplest version of turning this into a learning machine, but not yet a self-learning machine in this case, uh, would be to look at the output and uh, detect how, it, how much it deviates from your desired output and then uh, use say an electronic computer to update the weights. However, this, um, raises several questions. And if we look at the, our usual neural network uh, information processing, then of course we know the uh, forward pass is very efficient. It's just a sequence of matrix multiplication and uh, applying some nonlinearities. And in principle, one naive way of uh, going about learning would be to ask, uh, 
well, if I change one of the weights uh, internal to the network, then how would the change uh, propagate to the output? And uh, does that change go into the right direction that I want to get closer to my desired target output? The problem with this approach is, of course, um, if you have 1,000 weights, then this uh, requires 1,000 forward evaluations. So that's why this would be absolutely terrible. Uh, people say uh, it was done in the very early beginnings, but then came the very efficient backpropagation method where you have some error signal being fed back from the output and being propagated back through the whole structure. And instead of 1,000 uh, evaluations, you just need uh, the amount of effort that really is equivalent to one forward evaluation to do the full back propagation. So that's what we are using today. And so this raises the question, is there a physical version of back propagation that can be as efficient? And surprisingly, uh, the answer is yes. And this was already realized in a very, very pioneering work by uh, Wagner and Psaltis back in the 80s in the context of optical neural networks. So very uh, roughly what they were considering is some strong forward wave propagating through their device. And then in a very ingenious scheme, they had a weak backward error wave propagating the other direction. Of course, the backward uh, propagation signal, the error signal that we use in neural networks, we know this does not follow the same dynamics as the forward signal. So they had to make sure by some rather complex engineered uh, device that the transmission is not reciprocal. So the transmission of the forward wave might uh, be reminiscent of a sigmoid nonlinearity and the transmission of the backward wave uh, might be reminiscent uh, of the uh, gradient of this nonlinearity. And then in their uh, solution, they could really at least approximately have some version of optical back propagation. So this was one important invention that they brought about. And then the other idea was, okay, we also want to have some version of learning inside the device. We do not want to detect uh, anything and then uh, feedback externally. And so what they were using is basically the overlap between the forward and the backward wave would provide a nonlinear signal that would be used by a photorefractive effect to change a hologram locally. And then this change uh, changes, so to speak, the weight pattern. And uh, they could show that at least again, approximately, uh, this would give you what we would call self-learning. So learning inside the device by physical dynamics. And so um, there has been a range of activities on optical neural networks uh, back since then, uh, also using some um, other, for example, nonlinearities and so on. And uh, more recently, there has been renewed interest, of course, in the context of all this uh, uh, deep learning revolution. So people have started to look again at uh, how could we uh, implement different classical physical hardware devices uh, to, um, to implement something that is similar to neural networks? One has to say a little bit that um, some of the uh, more recent uh, approaches are actually, uh, it seems to me, a little bit less ambitious than uh, the pioneering work uh, done in the 80s that already included self-learning and optical backpropagation. So, what I will be telling you about here is uh, we take up this general notion and we ask, well, if I have an arbitrary nonlinear field theory, um, under which circumstances or how could I implement uh, physical backpropagation and even do it exactly without any approximation and without any uh, detailed fine tuning? And then also how could we implement in that context a general scheme for self-learning uh, dynamics? And maybe we could do it in such a way that it would be suitable for the modern integrated photonics devices, let's say, or also for other physical platforms. Okay, so let me first uh, go ahead and tell you again about the concept that uh, will have some inspiration, of course, taken from these pioneering works, but also some new elements. And I want to formulate it in the language of a general nonlinear wave field propagating, think of the nonlinear Schrödinger equation, if you like, or any other such nonlinear wave equation. So here's a field uh, propagating in space and time. Um, it's injected, say, from the left, it propagates to the right, but then it has some complicated dynamics due to the nonlinearities. And so uh, this field dynamics now should also depend, of course, on some 
let's say, learnable parameters on some background potential, on some refractive index or whatever is your physical setting. And so let me call this in general theta in reference to the weight parameters uh, in uh, neural networks that we often call theta. And if you change this physical parameter at, spot, at some spot x, you want to know what effect does this have on the uh, output uh, of the wave at, at, at some time capital T. And so uh, what this means is that you will have to look at the small perturbation created by the small change in the parameter locally, and then how the small perturbation propagates forward in time, always traveling on the background of the strong nonlinear wave. And of course, if you change uh, your physical parameters at this position X, then you will not have only a perturbation created at a particular time, but in fact, at all possible times, uh, you will create a perturbation that stems from, uh, from this delta theta. Okay, so this, uh, this then would allow you to ask the same naive question, okay, if I uh, locally change, tune up my parameter, uh, what would this mean for the outcome? But if you then, if you wanted to make a learning a scheme from that, as we just already discussed, you would have to pick all different positions, change parameters in all different manners, and this would be uh, highly inefficient. So that's why uh, we then say at time capital T, we actually do want to have a time reversal. So uh, if you think again of the Schrödinger wave field, uh, you would uh, replace the wave by its complex conjugate. Um, and thereby you create a backward wave that will actually independently of the complicated nonlinear field uh, dynamics magically, so to speak, uh, reconverge uh, to the input. And it will just be the time reverse. Uh, of the forward propagation. And I would uh, want to point out that in contrast to um, earlier approaches, there's a one relatively important difference to what I'm going to say. We entirely consider a strong backward wave. There's no forward wave present anymore. So um, that's in contrast to the other approaches and it will actually uh, allow us to, to make things exact and not only approximate. Okay, so then of course, uh, this allows you to ask, okay, if I were to inject now a small deviation at this time capital T, what happens to that? And of course, uh, as you might expect, uh, at least if the underlying dynamics is a time reversal invariant, also this perturbation travels back in time and will reconverge uh, on, the, on the places. So this is just a mirror symmetry uh, of, of what I showed you earlier. And so what would be this perturbation? Well, if you know what the input should have uh, resulted in. So if you have a target field that you wanted to have its time capital T, uh, then you could uh, take the deviation from this target field and feed it in uh, at time capital T. And so uh, the objective of all of this is of course, that if you set up the physical dynamics in a right way, uh, then uh, this, so to speak, small perturbation signal back propagating in a way uh, could be used to change the adaptive parameters like the refractive index or what you have uh, and uh, really enforce your self-learning dynamics. So that's the basic strategy. Okay. So now uh, let me tell you the same story uh, in some more mathematical language. And um, I will try to keep it simple, at least keep the notation simple by even completely neglecting the spatial dimension, that just really keeps the notation simple. And uh, in the end, that would be very easy to, to add to this. And uh, again, to keep it simple, I will uh, here look at a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but what I, the main points I make are completely general. So we have some nonlinear dynamics that is even fixed, that is not trainable. And we have some learnable dynamics. So it's as if this um, psi field is, subject to some external forcing theta of t. Um, so here, everything only depends on time and not on space, but this is just a small simplification. And so what we are interested in then is to say, okay, uh, if I were to perturb my external forcing field theta at some point in time, what does that mean for psi? So we just have to linearize the dynamics. This is the linearized dynamics with some inhomogeneous term uh, produced by um, delta theta or perturbation. And of course, some linear term uh, here with a symplectic uh, dynamics, because uh, if I am if I, already talking about this nonlinear dynamics and about time reversal, 
I really have to keep track of both Psi and uh, its complex conjugate. Okay, so this is like a, a kind of Hamiltonian, symplectic Hamiltonian. And so then um, I can take the Green's function that is uh, generated by this kind of Hamiltonian, and that will tell me what a small perturbation in my parameter theta uh, will effect in the uh, final time um, change of my field psi. Yeah. Okay. So what are we aiming for? Well, we uh, want to have that the final field psi at time capital T has maximum overlap uh, with some a target state, some output state. And so I would define a cost function like this. So that will be minimized if the overlap is maximized. And I can ask, okay, how would this uh, cost function change if uh, indeed uh, I implement such a small change of parameter delta theta and uh, get a corresponding delta psi? Now, this of course is only an overlap at this time capital T and this is not yet the back propagation step. So we want to rewrite this expression in a way that clarifies how physical back propagation would work. And so um, let's have a brief look at the Green's function again. So we said the underlying dynamics of the strong field, the nonlinear field uh, proceeds in one way from time zero to capital T. And then at capital T, we will completely complex conjugate that is a phase conjugate or time reverse the field and that it will uh, proceed uh, back. So, but in real time, of course, real time still moves forward to a time two times capital T. And so just by introducing this little t bar, which is always the reflected time, I can define a time reversed uh, dynamics, both for theta and for psi. And what I then find is some very general reciprocity relation. What I can you make use of is a very well-known general reciprocity uh, relation for Green's functions. And so what this then means for our um, cost function uh, derivative is that I can rewrite it in the manner shown here. So, okay, at first sight, maybe this is not very illuminating, but I can identify the different terms. And so the term on the left-hand side in the bracket, I can actually interpret as the perturbation signal that I would get at later times if at time capital T, I inject the target, yeah? So this is uh, what this first term can be interpreted as. Um, and the second term just uh, contains this um, a parameter field, my, my learning field theta. And so what this really means, I can now rewrite my learning gradient that I would need delta C over delta theta um, in terms of this perturbation that I just talked about, that is, you perturb uh, a time capital T according to the target and then watch how it propagates, how it uh, propagates back on uh, top of the strong uh, nonlinear field that also is somehow time reversed and propagates back. And then uh, you want to take the overlap with this very backward propagating strong nonlinear field. And so then the hope is that somehow you will have physical access to this overlap uh, as you're back propagating and if you do have physical access to this overlap and can engineer a physical dynamics that will change theta according to this overlap, then you are in business. Yeah? Then you have a physical back propagation in self learning. So to, to sum up uh, at least this part about physical back propagation, you would evolve forward uh, during time capital T, you would time reverse the full field and you would add a small perturbation that is actually the complex conjugate in this case of the target. And then you continue evolving during time capital T, but uh, what this will mean is now you have some backward dynamics, the piles propagating backward. And then of course, as a fourth step, very important, but I will talk about this slightly later, is that you want to update uh, theta according to this overlap that we wrote uh, up, uh, up there, roughly speaking, delta psi dagger times psi. But before I go to this fourth step, let me just illustrate what I mean with this, how, how this looks like, how the dynamics look like, and uh, what happens when you, when you actually train according to this procedure. So you would uh, feed in some input. I mean, 
if you think in uh, terms of three dimensions and you then have a two dimensional input, uh, that could be an image to be classified uh, that propagates through your device uh, under the uh, influence of this nonlinear dynamics, for example, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and under the influence of this uh, learning field theta. Then you would time reverse it. And again, uh, this sounds a little bit magical, but in the optical domain, there are uh, optical phase conjugation mirrors where you use nonlinear optical effects to do precisely this. And then finally, you would uh, back propagate through the device together with the small uh, target uh, error signal, and then hopefully uh, correctly update uh, your learning parameter. And so if you go through this procedure, and I, I still have to explain to you how, how, how the update of beta is physically implemented, but if you go through this procedure and uh, send through many um, training samples, for example, from the MNIST data set, so this is just an illustration, it's still relatively fresh data, um, then I will show you now after the training has concluded uh, what happens during the physical forward uh, propagation pass due to the nonlinear evolution if you feed in this uh, figure eight. And so, well, it looks a little bit crazy, but you will see that in the end, it will then finally converge to a spot. And so here are the different spots were, so to speak, predefined by us to denote the targets. So if, if we feed in an eight, then we would like to have uh, the target signal to be concentrated in this region. Okay. So now how does the learning dynamics really work? So this is the last important bit. Um, again, this was the example nonlinear field equation, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but uh, we concentrate here only on the term that couples the learning field theta to the evaluation field psi, let's say. And uh, such a term, of course, would come from an interaction energy of the form theta times psi squared. Now, what that means for theta for the learning field is that it experiences a force according to psi squared. Yeah? And it will experience this force both in the forward path and in the backward path. And specifically, it will not, of course, experience a force that is simply proportional to this delta psi times psi, which would be the learning signal that we want to be sensitive to. So the question is uh, what to do there. And so the, the general procedure that we came up with is some kind of echo. So you somehow want to make sure that during the forward pass, uh, theta would change according to psi squared and somehow during the backward pass, where the field, remember, has slightly changed, it would change according to minus psi squared. Some version of this procedure you want to have because then the difference, of course, between the two is exactly the learning signal to which you want to be sensitive. Okay. So the question is how to do this. And if you want to implement this, there are certainly things that don't work at first. So um, one idea you could have is to switch the coupling sign. So um, from the point of view of theta, this would be perfect if the coupling to psi squared is positive in the forward pass and then somehow magically because you change some material parameters or illuminate in a different way would be negative on the backward path. That would be perfect. That would do exactly what we want. However, unfortunately, uh, this will destroy the time reversal uh, invariance for the psi field, which we needed uh, for the whole scheme to work at all. So this doesn't work. Um, the other alternative, and this will eventually work, is time reversal for the theta field, for the learning field. So the general scheme is shown here in this cartoon. So pi theta is the momentum, theta is the variable, is the coordinate. Um, during the forward pass, we imagine that due to psi squared, we get a kick, a force that uh, kicks us up to the say positive momentum. Now, if we didn't do anything, then on the backward pass, we would get another positive kick and this is exactly not what we want. But if we are able to somehow time reverse the momentum, flip it down to negative values and then get the new kick from the backward pass, then we can arrange it such that if the two kicks are equal, you will just end up exactly at the same old spot. But if they are slightly different, then you end up at a different spot. And then, of course, this non-zero momentum 
And the subsequent dynamics will also translate in a non-zero change in the theta. And this is eventually what we need for learning. So, so that's the basic idea. We need some time reversal for theta. So um, how do you time reverse dynamics? And here's a little uh, brief um, excursion into physics, so to speak. Uh, imagine a charged particle moving to the right. You want to reverse the velocity. How do you do it? Well, it seems uh, you just apply a magnetic field uh, for just the right time and you have reverted the velocity. And this uh, time that you need is even independent of the velocity, so everything seems fine. This even works independently of where you put your charged particle initially, so you always can reverse the velocity. But there is a catch. And that is, if you really want to implement such a time reversal using a B field pulse, then by necessity, according to Maxwell, you also get a curl of the electric field. And if you work it out, then this is not just a minor nuisance, but actually you get a funny behavior, such as if you start at different spots with the same velocity, you end up at the same spot, but with different velocities, not at all what we wanted. And if you start at the same spot, but with different velocities, you end up at different spots, but with the same velocity, again, not what we wanted. So you always mix uh, momenta and positions. And there's actually no way out of this because it's connected to something much more basic, and namely that Hamiltonian dynamics does simply not allow time reversal. You cannot use Hamiltonian dynamics to just flip the sign of one or several momenta and not do anything else. And the simple mathematical reason is that the Poisson brackets or the commutators need to be conserved, so this doesn't work out. Sorry, and you have a couple of minutes left. Yes, I know. Okay. So, um, what are the ways around? Well, one way around would be a little bit cheating. You switch the sign of the mass, of course, not possible for material particles, but then you could flip the sign of the velocity without flipping the sign of the momentum. And the other one is to use dissipation and extra degrees of freedom. So here's what we want to achieve. Uh, keep the coordinate the same, flip the momentum. I claim first we need an extra degree of freedom. These equations actually do um, uh, fulfill the proper uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. And then the other thing that we need is, of course, all the extra degrees of freedom, P2 and X2, that we're mixing in, they should be zero at first and they should be reset to zero afterwards uh, because otherwise they will completely scramble everything. Yeah. And so uh, one simple way to achieve this physically is shown here. So imagine you have two modes. You can think of optical modes. And it's written in the language of uh, quantum optics. Um, you have parametric coupling, um, which you can get from nonlinearity and the drive. So A1 dagger, A2 dagger. If you work out the dynamics, you find that, yes, after the right amount of time, you can get A2 at time tau to be equal to A1 dagger, the uh, phase conjugate of the, initial, uh, of the initial signal. And then you would swap it back and you dissipate the extra degree ancillary, ancillary degree of freedom number two. And then you would really have a phase conjugated um, uh, your mode A1. Okay. And so uh, turning now to a table to list what are the general requirements. So for the Psi field, we need it to be to have time reversal invariant dynamics, also in the presence of phi, neglecting for the moment the slow learning dynamics of phi. And we need to be able to time reverse it. For the theta field, we need this kind of echo. So we need to time reverse it, which needs dissipation and extra degrees of freedom. And for the theta field also, we have another consideration that I didn't talk about so far, which is once you have trained it, it should be kept in memory. So there should be no dissipation along the relevant degree of freedom. We want to keep it. And so, um, if you are already talking about, say, optical modes and oscillators, one idea you could have is to engineer a limit cycle. You energy pump the system, you have a limit cycle like in a laser, the phase on the limit cycle, that could be your learning uh, parameter theta. Unfortunately, it turns out that this doesn't work because by clamping your system to a limit cycle, you have only left one phase based degree of freedom and this simply doesn't work out. The way out is to, to use two coupled modes actually. So that's the simplest way out. Again, some parametric pumping, some care. So these are ingredients that are very standard in, in nonlinear optics. And then you can engineer a kind of Mexican hat potential where you have uh, this, uh, where you have enough degrees of freedom, uh, so to speak, to implement 
uh, the right learning dynamics. Okay, so this is just a brief simulation. So uh, along this Mexican head valley, uh, you would in the forward pass get a kick, then you have an echo, then you have another kick, you have another echo, and then you have a free evolution that finally is dissipated away because you have some remaining dissipation and you get a learning signal, a change in your theta parameter that is exactly uh, what you needed. Okay, and then finally, just uh, for wrapping up, uh, what kinds of physical systems would you think about to implement this? Well, the mindset we have is really thinking in terms of integrated optics. So you would have linear propagation that is fixed, and then you have sites where you have nonlinear interactions and you also have the learnable field. Um, and one way to think of it is a couple of waveguides and resonators, similar to say what the MIT group uh, has uh, demonstrated the first beginnings of. Uh, and then you would have either nonlinear optics in these uh, micro resonators as one example of a good platform, or possibly also mechanical degrees of freedom, optomechanics, or nonlinear microwave circuits, maybe even nonlinear meta waves, I don't know. So this uh, is my conclusion, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Florian. So uh, the talk is open for questions. You can type them into the chat or you can just speak. So while people are uh, gathering their thoughts, how, what you, you mentioned a few physical um, embodiments at the very end. So I mean, presumably no one has done all of these ingredients in any of those, but what, which ones which are there? What are the partial physical results? So which of your necessary ingredients have been kind of demonstrated physically? Okay, so um, in terms of neural networks and integrated optics, yeah, there are only very few first results using uh, photonic chips like waveguides. That's the MIT uh, group of Soljacic and Englund uh, I mentioned. Um, all the rest here, uh, these are examples of physical platforms that have been demonstrated for various applications, just not for, not for neural uh, networks. And you can estimate, for example, the parameters. Yeah? So if you use these nonlinear resonators and remi uh, uh, remember we are completely in the, we are completely in the, classical regime here. I'm only talking about large signals, classical devices, we talk about milliwatt input power, for example, and then you can get uh, very appreciable nonlinear effects. And then you could get effects that uh, within, I don't know, time scales of around 10 nanoseconds or something of that order, you could actually, uh, for example, do this uh, phase conjugation that you need uh, and so on. So uh, these that, are platform. Have those yeah. been demonstrated for your tasks? The, your ingredients, like the phase conjugation itself. Well, uh, what do you mean with my ingredients? So you the, the ingredients I'm using are, are things like uh, Kerr effect, um, parametric pumping, and all these have been individually demonstrated. Uh, maybe not all for all platforms in all circumstances. Uh, but none of that has been demonstrated for the purpose of uh, physical backpropagation and, and the self-learning, of course. That, that's a challenge for the future. And then we will, uh, of course, uh, once you get very concrete, you sit down with an experimentalist for any particular one of the platforms, and then you have to optimize parameters. So there are a couple of questions in the chat. Peter. Mm -hmm. um, Hi, Florian. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Hello. I was wondering, um, is the point here to build such systems like the England group at MIT, or is it to actually prove that, you know, such systems are possible and useful? Um, so my point is to say we can actually have both the backpropagation and self-learning dynamics in the kinds of integrated systems that are being uh, envisioned and partially implemented nowadays uh, with, with regards to implementing uh, physically implementing neural networks. So, so that's my message. Okay, so um, so these things are being built currently, right? These systems? Uh, all of these physical platforms exist, yes. Wow, okay, and that's great. Built, yes. 
Yeah, and so for example, what um, use does the England group at MIT foresee, you know, the, the, his, their system being used for in the future? W what are the applications here? Okay, that, that's a good general question. I mean, that the same applies already to the, say, 80s um, optical neural networks. So um, I guess details will depend on the, on the, on the physical implementation. And no one claims at the moment that um, necessarily such alternative physical hardware implementations will outperform uh, even after optimization the say silicon versions because that, that's something that's a challenge we always have in any area where people try to come up with hardware alternatives to silicon but what I can imagine very well is of course if you have sufficiently performant, uh, say, platforms based on nonlinear optics, and your input signals are also naturally optical signals, and somehow you want to do online learning uh, and have a very high uh, data rate of training samples coming in, uh, then that, for me, sounds like an attractive proposition. That is great. And is there any last little question? Is there any application in quantum computing with these systems, or are they all classical systems? Um, okay. So right now we were all purely thinking about classics, uh, classical dynamics. Um, it's not obvious. I mean, uh, I should say all of these platforms are all also being explored in the quantum domain. For example, these nonlinear microwave circuits, they, they are the basis of superconducting circuit uh, qubits and so on. Yeah? So all of them are ex uh, explored in the, uh, in, the, um, um, in the quantum do domain. However, the scheme I was presenting at least as you've seen, really relied on uh, dissipation uh, at, at several points. And at the moment, I don't see easily how to get uh, rid of that. So then that would require very strong modifications and new ideas to take maybe pieces or ingredients here and uh, transfer them uh, to the quantum domain. Okay, thank you. Let's squeeze in a few more questions. Ricardo? Yeah, so um, thank you for the talk, the issue of uh... In situ learning is uh, actually very exciting. Can I just ask a very uh, general question? Uh, so um, there are other candidates for, for the same purpose. I mean, having an optical device is fantastic. It's very interesting. However, do you have a, a, an opinion uh, with respect to other technology? Can you make it just a quick comparison between different alternatives? Well, okay. So, for true self-learning together with um, physical back propagation, what would you be thinking of? Well, that, that was my, my question. I, I, I'm okay, yeah, so, so I, uh, it, I may be missing something obviously, um, but um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not aware outside this, uh, say optical context of, of simple alternatives, but I may be missing something. Okay. Okay, last question, Corbinian. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> maybe, maybe I didn't understand the architecture that well, but so if you have a, if you make a chip for one application, can you, can you use the same architecture in principle for other applications as well? Or would you have to redesign and recreate the chip for each application? Um, so with application, you mean a certain data set or what? So yeah, maybe maybe both. So for example, the same application in the sense of doing classification, but one for a data set of cats and dogs and one for MNIST. Oh, no, 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 yeah, no, no. So this is completely general in the same way that you would have a neural network. Of course, maybe you fix the structure. So the amount of neurons per layer and the layers and maybe the connectivity uh, as a whole, but then you can use this in principle for completely different uh, data sets. Um, of course, if you if if this is a real uh, hardware implementation, and then you wanted to now drastically change, say, yeah, the connectivity or the number of neurons, then presumably you would uh, need a different device. But other than that, it's the same story as for the standard neural network. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. 